The results of Germany's federal elections are out, but the outcome is by no means decided yet. The Social Democrats overtook the current ruling Christian Democrats as the strongest party, with a narrow 1.6% lead. The centre-left party's victory was fueled by strong support for Olaf Scholz, who they've put forward as Chancellor to replace the outgoing Mrs Angela Merkel. But for Mr Scholz and his party to take office, they need to form a ruling coalition with the minor parties, the environmentalist Greens, who is at 48.8%, uh, their best ever election, and the pro-business Free Democrats at 11.5%. And despite their worst performance since the World War II um, and their unpopular candidate for Chancellor, Mr Armin Lachette, the ruling Conservatives aim to hold on to their power by wooing the smaller parties as well, making them the ultimate kingmakers. With all four parties out to strike a deal, there's weeks of uncertainty ahead before a government is formed, and we discuss what this means for Germany as well as its place in the world. And for this, we connect with Dr Ed Turner, reader in politics of Ashton University and co-director of the Ashton Centre for Europe, and Dr Thomas Berger, professor of international relations at Boston University. Very warm welcome to you both. It's been a very exciting uh, last 24, 48 hours. And well, there's a lot to discuss, uh, but starting with you, Dr Turner, now what is your interpretation of this very uh, narrow margin outcome? What do you think this uh, very slim margin between the ruling party and the Social Democrats indicates? Well, it was an extremely uh, unusual election. Uh, of course, just a few months ago, the Social Democrats looked like they would come third. Uh, they've uh, managed to uh, catch up and overtake the Greens and the Christian Democrats. And I think really the story of the election is one of disaster um, for the Christian Democrats. Their lead candidate uh, had a very, very difficult campaign. Uh, already there were doubts about his crisis management capabilities uh, because of the COVID pandemic uh, in his home state of North Rhine-Westphalia. Uh, but then his handling of floods in his home state and in particular, a dreadful image of him laughing and joking uh, with party colleagues while the federal president made a speech uh, commemorating the victims went down very badly. And uh, it was a campaign focused on personalities and the outcome suggested that Germans could absolutely see Olaf Scholz as the successor to Angela Merkel, but were very reluctant to see Armin Laschet, the Christian Democrat, in the role. Mm -hmm. And Dr Berger, how did you... Uh, interpret this outcome. I mean, what aspects of this uh, very, um, very abnormal election stand out to you the most? Well, I mean, I agree with everything that my colleague, uh, Dr. Turner Edge, has said. Um, but I would sort of step back and uh, sort of taking a look at the bigger picture, there are sort of two things which stand out for me. First of all, uh, for a long time, Germany, German politics was dominated by two big center parties, the so-called Volksparteien, the People's Parties, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats. The Christian Democrats have done very poorly and the Social Democrats have uh, in some ways uh, come back. They have a comeback, but uh, neither party is able to play the kind of um, a central uh, role that they traditionally have. So we look like we're entering into a new era where um, we will be having multiple parties and uh, that means German has always had a coalition since the 1950s, but uh, it'll be more difficult than it has been in the past building a coalition um, uh, out of that. And the other thing which is uh, worth mentioning uh, parenthetically is that unlike 2017, when we saw the far left and the far right wing parties, the Link, uh, the Linke and the um, uh, Alternative for Germany, Alternative for Deutschland parties coming on strong, this time uh, the the sort of radical, um, more extreme parties have uh, languished. And so that's probably good news from the point of view of, of mainstream German politics. And Dr. Berger, it's um, become quite clear that what Germans want is change and they face a lot of challenges, um, including unaffordable, unaffordable housing, uh, climate change and outdated digital infrastructure. And while well, they have the coali uh, coalition negotiations um, that are going to be ongoing for the next coming weeks. But whatever combination that makes up the coalition government, will they be able to deliver the sort of change that Germans want to see? Well, if you look at opinion polls, um, yes, the people say they want change. 
Um, and uh, I think sort of one of the areas which is clearly front and center is in the area of environmental policy. So right now we have pretty much across the German political spectrum an agreement that uh, Germany must do more uh, and help lead not only for Germany, but also for the rest of Europe and if possible the world, a sort of new push to address the issue of especially climate change. Um, the terrible rains which killed almost 200 people in Germany this summer uh, is widely interpreted as reflecting the kind of problems that uh, is coming to Germany and to the entire world uh, because of uh, environmental changes. The problem is, are you willing to pay for it? What cost are you willing to, uh, to pay in terms of your own personal life uh, to make that uh, kind of change uh, possible? And there I think we're going to have a little bit more difficulty uh, getting people on board. Um, and I think we'll have some more things to say about that, but we are going to see some really very different points of view uh, uh, coming out in the coalition uh, negotiations in the next few months. And Dr. Turner, the, uh, the parties that are going to be uh, negotiating this coalition government, it seems that they stand very, uh, they stand vastly apart when it comes to things like taxes. And well, how do you think the coalition talks are going to go? What kind of concessions do you think uh, Mr. Schultz might have to make if he wants to become the next chancellor? Well, that's absolutely right. So um, I think w what you have in mind is the so-called traffic light coalition, which I certainly see as uh, by far the most likely outcome. That's the alliance of Olaf Scholz's Social Democrats with the Greens uh, and the Liberal Free Democrats. And they're quite well aligned on uh, some issues of, if you like, uh, around values, around, uh, around social policy. So, for example, on things like data protection, uh, on... Um, potentially a reform of nationality law um, uh, on drugs policy, uh, they might reach agreement relatively easy. We'll come on to it, but I think on foreign policy, they're also quite well aligned. Um, the real challenges are in some of the big questions in fiscal, economic uh, and environmental policy, um, where in particular the Free Democrats are quite a long way away from the Social Democrats and the Greens. I mean, in terms of uh, what sort of policy concessions the Social Democrats would have to make, I think the FDP will push hard for some tax uh, reductions for uh, higher earners. Uh, that's something they'll, they'll push hard on. They'll push hard to get the finance ministry. Uh, they will also then push for swifter budget consolidation um, after, uh, as we come out of the pandemic. Uh, and that's at a German level and probably a European level as well. Those are going to be some of the uh, Liberals' key demands. And Dr. Turner, while Germany's political parties try to um, strike out a uh, strike a coalition deal, what do you think this means for Brussels as the EU deals with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the economic fallout? Well, that, that's, that's a very uh, interesting point. I mean, first of all, there's actually real nervousness about several months of hiatus where uh, there's uh, no new government in place. Everyone's preoccupied with coalition negotiations. There's only a caretaker government, which in practice can't do that much. And you know, one thing from I'm um, speaking to you from the United Kingdom, we're concerned about is the impact on the COP, on the climate change talk, for example. Um, Germany could, could sign up for a deal, but it probably can't play the sort of leadership role um, that, that you might expect. So there's that nervousness. And then beyond that, uh, while, while the Social Democrats and the Greens on economic issues would push for greater European uh, integration, the Free Democrats are in a different position. Um, I was in a conversation yesterday where uh, the thought of uh, Christian Lindner, uh, the Free Democrat leader, uh, becoming finance minister was said to be you know, real anathema to France because it would really put the brakes on uh, European uh, fiscal integration. And I, I think there's something in that. Um, the new party, the potential coalition there, would be much more open to uh, integration on uh, foreign policy, but that's also a difficult route uh, for Germany to go down. And Dr. Berger, there are a lot of questions about uh, what this is going to mean for Germany and the EU's uh, foreign policy and defence policy. I mean, what does the change? What will the change of office, um, with the outgoing Mrs. Merkel, mean for the EU's defence policy as it sets out on its Indo-Pacific strategy? And do you think it's that Europe is going to be left behind, um, especially with the new AUKUS alliance and, sorry, the AUKUS pact and the um, security relations between Brussels and Washington becoming uh, gradually more distant. Well, I, 
Let me say that uh, this is already a problem now and has been for a while, especially from the U.S. point of view. Um, uh, the good news for the U.S., there's good news and bad news. The good news in an American point of view is uh, that Germany will continue to be a stable uh, partner for the United States, uh, that uh, the parties which are coming into office, all of them are committed to NATO and to European integration, and there's not going to be any change uh, in that sense. The bad news is that when push comes to shove, it's very difficult to get the Germans to do more on defense. Um, uh, Angela Merkel um, uh, already in instituted some changes, but they're really very marginal changes from our point of view. The Bundeswehr went from about 184,000 troops to 202,000 troops. Uh, they agreed with a great deal of difficulty to send uh, troops on uh, peacekeeping missions to new places again, Mali, in support of the French. Um, but these are going to be really more symbolic uh, measures than anything else. Germany did send, um, uh, has been sent, been under Merkel, has been making some uh, gestures towards also getting more involved, as other European countries are, in Asian security issues. Uh, but again, uh, this is not a high priority and will continue not to be a high priority. Um, most German political energy is going to be consumed with dealing with other issues, um, uh, above all the kind of economic issues that uh, Dr. Turner was just referring to earlier. And Dr. Turner, Mrs. Merkel, she was always careful not to upset ties with Russia and China, and she did maintain a working relationship with them, um, despite their fundamental differences. Meanwhile, the US has been hoping for a more active security cooperation from Berlin. What do you think the change of office um, is going to mean for Germany's relations with the Kremlin and Beijing? Uh, so, so it's, I suspect that Germany will become slightly more hawkish on both that it will be a small shift rather than a radical shift. Um, the Green Party's position is very focused on human rights uh, and relatively dismissive of the uh, economic uh, impact uh, of, of, of uh, I suppose, trying to preserve strong, stronger ties or at least a, a closer relationship, uh, particularly with Russia, but also with China. So the Greens, I think, would look to shift the dial I think it's very possible the Greens will get the foreign ministry. Uh, on paper, uh, particularly the Liberals are in the same place, but I think in practice they will be slightly more responsive to business interests. But in fact, the chancellery uh, on these big questions in foreign policy holds many of the cards, wields a lot of the power, uh, and the Social Democrats uh, are, have historically been very cautious about undermining uh, relations with Russia and closing off dialogue too much. So I don't. I think you know they will push back against some of the more uh, radical green demands, uh, and uh, on China maybe a little bit more hawkish as well. But but we're talking about relatively marginal changes rather than a wholesale transformation. And Dr. Berger, do you think whoever becomes the next chancellor is going to be able to maintain the sort of stability and trust that Mrs. Merkel built in the regional bloc? Well, that's uh, something that we can't foretell at this point. I mean, Merkel was not always Merkel. <laughs> I mean, when she came into office, she um, had she faced significant internal challenges. Um, she seemed relatively inexperienced in foreign affairs, and it wasn't at all clear that she would be, uh, emerge to be the kind of leader that she, in fact, has become. Um, a lot will depend um, on the ability of the German uh, leaders, the next leadership, to be able to create a stable and productive uh, government. And uh, in time, they can grow into that role. Um, what is remains true, uh, however, is that Germany is the largest economy in Europe. It is uh, approximately a $4 trillion economy. It is one of the world's top three exporters. It has significant technological uh, 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 resources. And it has uh, de facto uh, veto power over uh, what the EU does in a wide range of areas. And uh, so uh, Germany will be important because it has to be important. And I suspect that that will be true for the next government. And Dr. Turner, in the meantime, many speculate that French President um, Emmanuel Macron will try and move in and push through some of his visions for Europe. Um, what's your view on this? Do you think there are going to be some clashes when it comes to maybe economic reform or fiscal management? Well, as, as, as we've said, these are going to be difficult issues to resolve domestically in Germany 
Um, the free Democrats will be difficult to get on board uh, with the economic aspect of that agenda. Uh, and of course, even if there's an agreement, then also Germany's federal constitutional court will be watching quite closely to see what can happen. Um, we're about to enter the French presidential election campaign as well, which uh, may generate more more heat than light. So um, I, I think that will be that will potentially be quite difficult. Um, uh, overall, uh, you, know, you know, often there's been frustration in Paris at what they perceive to be a rather slow, rather rather overly pragmatic, sometimes rather negative German approach, uh, rather than something bolder. Uh, and I suspect uh, that uh, is quite likely to continue to be a frustration. Um, I mean, the other the other interesting unresolved question uh, in all of this is the approach to Central Europe and particularly um, to Poland. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Poland is likely to take quite a different stance on some aspects uh, of uh, European uh, integration and be much more cautious about undermining the transatlantic relationship. And so in that sort of balance between uh, Warsaw and Paris, it'll be quite interesting to see where exactly uh, Berlin lands. Well, we'll have to wait and see the developments coming in the uh, coming weeks. But this is where we have to leave the interview for today. That was Dr. Ed Turner, reader in politics of Ashton University and co-director of Ashton Centre for Europe, and Dr. Thomas Berger, professor of international relations at Boston University. Thank you both so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.